all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Christ the Lord became obedient unto death. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We pray you of your mercy, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, look graciously, we pray, on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners, and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals, so shall he startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, and for that, for that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. 
He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I so far from my cry and from the words of my distress. Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. I A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. 
Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caliphas, the high priest that year. Caliphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it is better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You're not also one of his man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police have made a charcoal fire because it was cold, 
and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? And those who heard what I had said to them, they know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, to the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would have handed him over, would we not have handed him over to you? Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he had indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So, you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? 
After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priest and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to the law, he ought to die because he, claimed, he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the, bench, on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 
Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothing among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots, and that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, <clears throat> especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified broken and, and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, <clears throat> so he came <clears throat> and removed the body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bearing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it in the spice, 
with the spices and linen cloth, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now, there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. So because it was the Jewish, Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. See, <clears throat> excuse me. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just before Julian of Norwich, the English mystic, medieval mystic, just before Julian was granted her visions, and while she was still in bed thinking that she was about to die, she had herself propped up, leaning back with her head supported by bedclothes. Julian wanted her gaze to be fixed upwards towards heaven as she died. But there was a priest that had been called in to see her, and the priest had other ideas. The parson, she tells us, set the cross before my face and said, Daughter, I have brought you the image of your Savior. Look at it and take comfort from it in reverence of him who died for you and me. Julian wasn't so sure. It seemed to me that I was all right as I was, she writes, for my gaze was fixed upwards into heaven where I trusted I was going. She consented, though. Apparently even a meddlesome parson can be occasionally right. So she fixed her eyes on the face of Christ on the crucifix. And thus, her showings, the revelations of divine love, the visions that she would reflect upon for the rest of her life, decades, they began. They began with a darkening of everything around her apart from a light shone on the crucifix, a light for all humankind, she says. Everything other than the cross in that moment became ugly to her. The visions would continue almost right away with blood, red blood trickling down from under the crown of thorns, hot and fresh, plentiful and lifelike. The cross can be a difficult thing to gaze upon. And like Julian, we might rather look toward the bliss of heaven than toward suffering, the suffering of others, the suffering of Jesus. But if we were to just look away, we would have a much harder time learning the ways of love 
and the way of Christian kindness. Julian had about 20 years or so to reflect on her visions. And as she reflected on them over those decades, those visions that began with the training of her eyes upon the cross, she would learn to see God first and foremost through Christ crucified. It was through Christ crucified that she would see God as Trinity. In her gaze upon the bleeding Jesus, God as Trinity filled her with joy. For Trinity is God, God is the Trinity, she says. The Trinity is our maker, the Trinity is our protector, the Trinity is our everlasting lover, the Trinity our endless joy and our bliss. By our Lord Jesus Christ and in our Lord Jesus Christ, where Jesus appears, the blessed Trinity is always understood as I see it, she says. And this does include on the cross, there where Jesus appears in suffering so the Trinity is understood. There understood on the cross is not just a suffering man, but the God who makes and protects and loves. Here on the cross, Julian sees God incarnate. Andre pointed out this week that I preach on kindness often. Apparently he's right, because here I am again. For me, the interest in the kindness of God comes from Julian. Janet Soskis wrote on Julian, and, and this is what she says. She says, Christ is our kind according to Julian. Christ is our kind, a human being like us. And so the kindness of God in Christ is not the same really as being nice. The kindness of God in becoming our kind, human kind, is an expression of the deepest solidarities of God with us in Jesus. The cross, in this way, is an expression of just how far God's kindness goes. This is the implication of God becoming of one kind with us. The kindness of God leads to the cross. God being of one kind with us in his humanity is a kindness even up to death and death on a cross. Jesus does not leave his humanity behind as he is affixed and as he suffers, but rather lives out its fullness. When Julian sees all of God's work in Christ revolving around the cross and the crucifix upon which she gazes, she is in good company. She's in the company of St. John the Evangelist, author of the fourth gospel, and whose voice we heard so clearly today in the Passion. John, too, sees the cross as the hinge upon which the world turns. The cross is where we understand who God is in God's fullness. For John, there is no looking away from the cross. Instead, we gaze upon it like the serpent raised in the wilderness in order that we might be healed. John, in describing Jesus being lifted up and exalted on the cross, uses the same word that he would have read in the Greek version of Isaiah we just heard read. It is the suffering servant who is exalted and lifted up. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. So marred was his appearance beyond human semblance. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity.
When John speaks of Christ on the cross, John would like us to think of this suffering servant, the suffering servant who suffers with us. But this suffering servant does not only suffer with us. The suffering servant suffers for us. He has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. By his bruises we are healed. As we hear the story of the crucifixion of Jesus, John would have us keep this passage from Isaiah in mind. That Jesus on the cross does not simply suffer with us, but suffers also for us. And so the cross is two sorts of kindness. It is an act of kindness that expresses God's own solidarity with us in our own suffering and an act of kindness that expresses God's own work undertaken for us accomplishing something we cannot do on our own and that is the bearing and extinguishing of our sin on a cross that makes an exchange a cross where a sacrifice is made for us and where we are reconciled to God Perhaps we hear this all most clearly when we read Hebrews. The way of God's kindness with us and the way of God's kindness towards us, both of them coming together. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. There is no suffering that God does not know in Christ, including the depths of your own. Suffering at the hands of others. Suffering the unkindnesses of others the suffering of failing bodies, the suffering that comes with the loss of the ones we love, and above all, suffering for the sake of our love of God. God in Christ knows all these things. This God in Christ, suffering on this cross, is as weak as we are as tested as we are, as much a failure as we are. Because this is God with us on the cross, according to his kindness with us. But being without sin, he is able to accomplish something else too. Without sin, he cannot be taken up by the clutches of death. They have no power over him. And in this way, in the way that he defeats death, in this death, he is now able to lead us, reconciled in him, forgiven in him, leading us not to death, but leading us to life. Being without sin, Jesus is more than with us on the cross. Without sin, as the blameless and innocent sacrificial victim, he reconciles us to God where he is for us on the cross. And in both of these ways, Christ with us on the cross, cross suffering as we do and Christ 
for us on the cross, accomplishing that which we cannot do, we find in each of those an expression of God's loving kindness, a kindness with us and a kindness towards us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, that all who believe in Him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with Him of eternal life. Let us pray for the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic Church of Christ throughout the world. For its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Todd, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that the Lord will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by your Spirit, the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy Church, that in our vocation and ministry we may truly and devoutly serve you, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, for Charles, our King, and all the royal family, for Justin, our Prime Minister, and for the government of this country. For Doug, the Premier of this province, and the members of the Legislature. For Barry, the Mayor of this municipality, and those who serve with him. And for those on City Council, for all who serve the common good. that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth that justice and peace may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, and all who suffer persecution or prejudice, for the sick, the wounded, and the handicapped, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and the bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love 
and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, hear the cry of those in misery and need. In their afflictions, show them your mercy and give us, we pray, the strength to serve them. For the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ. For all who have not heard the words of salvation. For all who have lost their faith for all whose sin has made them indifferent to Christ for all who actively oppose Christ by word or deed for all who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples for all who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this life and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which are cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In a moment, we will begin the meditation on the cross of Jesus. I invite you to do this in any way that is comfortable or appropriate for you. The prayer desks will be here if you'd like to come forward and kneel at them and pray. You can come forward and just stand before the cross or do whatever makes most sense to you. Christ, our Lord, became obedient unto death. Come, let us worship.
as our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Send down your abundant blessing, Lord, upon your people who have devoutly recalled the death of your Son in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Grant them pardon. Bring them comfort. May their faith grow stronger and their eternal salvation be assured. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.